homosexuality, gays and lesbians, they've been around since the beginning of mankind, really. But it really first draws notice as communities with industrialization. So what you're doing is you're getting people from the country, they're moving into the cities, they're getting separated from their families, they have a little bit more freedom, a lot more anonymity, and they start forming their own groups. And some of those groups uh, start becoming LGBT communities. But it doesn't really spark further out. The foundation of that comes with World War II. Going into World War II, you have a lot of people thrown into same-sex environments as soldiers or as as, uh, women in factories and uh, LGBT people discover each other essentially for the first time in, in US history. And when they come back home, they decide they're gonna stay in San Francisco and LA and New York and Washington DC. What happens though is that in the East, there's purges of gay and lesbian people within federal employment. So it kind of leads to a little bit of a, a migration out West. A gentleman named Harry Hay realized that the LGBT community is an oppressed minority group. And so he starts voicing that opinion. Starting in the 1940s, he uh, starts writing about it to his own and handing it out to other people. He goes to beaches to get people interested. Nobody is interested. It's dangerous to be LGBT. We don't want to stir up any more trouble than we're already getting but he eventually gets a small following and that's how the Mattachine Society starts. He built it on communist fundamentals and so highly secretive. They didn't even know if they could gather at this particular time if that would even be legal. Bars were continually being raided and closed and people arrested. Disorderly conduct laws could be used against gays and lesbians at the time for wearing anything like an article of clothing of the opposite gender, holding hands. Any sort of affection towards a member of the same sex could get you thrown in jail. The uh, inmates and police really had very little sympathy for the gay and lesbian community. They would lose their jobs. Often their employers were contacted and that was a reason to be fired during that era. In fact, in uh, 1953, Eisenhower signed a law which made it illegal to be gay in federal employment. That sort of statute was carried on through uh, very state and local governments as well. They were also very scared about Hoover and uh, Hoover's capabilities in uh, surveillance. When they set up these meetings, they would set it up in a household, but they wouldn't tell uh, the people whose household it was. They wouldn't say who was leading the meeting. They only used people's first names. They would arrive at staggered times, so it wouldn't be obvious there was a meeting at all. They would close the windows. People would leave at different times. They'd put the telephones in cabinets and lock them up because they were afraid of eavesdropping devices. And this sort of cloak of secrecy was to protect the members and to try to grow membership before authorities could come in and, and really shut them down. To find your way into a community and perhaps maybe even become politically active uh, was a very difficult journey to undertake in the 1950s. There were, of course, laws across the country prohibiting same-sex couples from engaging in sexual content. It was mostly same-sex male couples who would have been arrested and thrown into jail for uh, violating these laws. The psychological establishment, also in the 1950s, was much more influential in American culture then than it is today. A lot of psychologists, psychoanalysts, counselors saw homosexuality as a mental illness and they attempted to cure it by putting gay men and lesbians and transgender people through all sorts of what we would now see as rather horrifying treatments, including electric shock therapy, emetic therapy, so they would give people medication that would make them sick and then they would show them images that they presume would arouse them. So instead of being aroused, uh, the, the subjects would become sick. And then, of course, religious organizations were very homophobic as well. Many church-going people and ministers and priests labeled homosexuality a grave sin. I was born in Texas as a daughter of a Baptist preacher. I came out in 61, but from the late 50s. I know about the, uh, the scene only from my sister. She was at Texas Women's University and she was expelled for being homosexual. Very often women would just like disappear overnight because they would have these purges every now and then. Brenda was more of a dramatic 
than that. They didn't just whisk her away at night. Her lover's father down in Houston had gotten hold of some love notes they had sent each other. And he locked her lover up in the house under house arrest. Brenda drove down to Houston, knocked on the door. She was going to rescue Joan. And when she got in the house, Joan's father beat her with a rubber hose. Somehow Brenda managed to get Joan anyway and they escaped. So Brenda was arrested, handcuffed, and taken to uh, the police station. So was Joan. And they were talked at in really filthy ways. And Brenda was told that if she repudiated her homosexuality, she could stay in college. And this is how she became my hero. She refused. In 1952, one of the early members, Dale Jennings, gets arrested on uh, lewd conduct charges. And instead of just trying to keep it quiet and paying the fine, they fight it in the courts and they win. The Mattachine Society backs Dale Jennings and it leads to an explosion of the Mattachine Society. So they start promoting this group. Chapters open all throughout Los Angeles, San Francisco, all across the nation. And when you start getting to that scale, all of a sudden they can't keep it secret anymore. So in 1953, there's a convention. The members decide they don't want a secret society anymore, that it's not the right time to have of this type of leadership within the organization and they end up actually pushing Harry Hay out of his own organization and the original founders. The Mattachine Society merges into more of a kind of a social group. It starts getting involved in uh, political issues and political causes of, of that regard. But it actually launches One Magazine, which was the first LGBT publication really broadly distributed in the United States. They start doing uh, social services, travel around, they go to New York and Chicago and San Francisco and work with groups there to raise education, to raise consciousness. And it really kind of starts building really on what the Mattachine Society did, on the idea that the LGBT community is an oppressed minority group and they need to come together to fight for civil rights. The Tavern Guild was founded in San Francisco by and for the owners of gay bars and their employees. Gay bars had a very short shelf life. They would maybe be open for a couple of years if a bar was closed typically what would happen would be uh, the tavern guild would help the bartenders and the barbacks find jobs in other gay bars because these people were typically out and well known they could only find employment in other gay bars so it became this interesting network that played a similar purpose that the Madison Society did but particularly for the system of gay bars Council on Religion and Homosexual was really the first time where you had gay rights activists working together with liberal Protestant ministers. Apparently the original idea for this came from Del Martin and Phyllis Lyon, the founders of the Daughters of Belitis, one of the first lesbian organizations in the United States. If one of the main arguments against gay and lesbian people was that they are sinners, what happens if you get a bunch of ministers in their collars saying that these people are not sinners, they are humans in your midst, they have been persecuted, and they deserve our love and respect. All of a sudden, gay and lesbian people are no longer sinners, they are people who need your help. I moved to L.A. in 1968. Brenda had moved out here a couple of years earlier. So once again, I followed my big sister. We joined the Gay Liberation Front. It's when the, uh, the American Psychiatric Association was having their annual convention. And that year, 1970, they were having it at the Biltmore Hotel in downtown Los Angeles. And one of the topics was um, how to cure homosexuality with electric shock treatment. So we had made arrangements. We knew what we were going to do. We had already entered the ballroom and interspersed ourselves among the psychiatrists and psychologists. And they were showing this film, and suddenly one of our number stood up and he yelled, Are we going to stand for this shit? And we all stood up and said, Hell no. So we all got out of our seats and we got up on the stage and we stopped the showing of the film. Um, Don Hefter was very vocal. They just, that you are not going to show this film. You have uh, caused us, uh, people to commit suicide. You have, you're, you're going to listen to us for a change. Three years later, the American Psychological Convention removed homosexuality as a, a mental illness which was wonderful, wonderful step. And I know that the Biltmore invasion had a lot to do with it.